African Accent uh, takes uh, great pride in bringing you um, consistently uh, for the past six years or so the contributions of, our, of some of our uh, le uh, legendary uh, contributors consisting of uh, the faculty um, our emerging uh, students themselves and um, our great administrators including the president of the college, uh, the provost and tonight uh, for the first time uh, through uh, the uh, contributions and recommendations of uh, Larry Simpson, the provost of Berkeley College of Music, and I was encouraged uh, by Larry uh, to invite uh, an administrator uh, that he holds in great esteem. Uh, her name is Dr. Crystal Banfield, uh, African Ascent's guest for the first time. Uh, before I go any further, um, uh, there is a statement that some professionals uh, have made about her, which um, I would like to read uh, in total uh, instead of uh, summarizing it. Uh, this was written in uh, 2012 by um, Alan Bosch uh, when she was just appointed to be Dean of Berkeley City, of music, uh, City Music. Uh, Crystal Banfield has been appointed Dean of Berkeley City Music. In this role, she becomes the first African-American woman on the college's executive leadership team. Banfield previously served as senior director for the department. She is now the chief academic officer and operational leader for city music programs in Boston and at 38, 38 Berkeley City Network sites across the U.S. She's quite busy. She's responsible for establishing and upholding academic standards for education and broadly guiding faculty development, research assessment, and programming for all locations, for all the 38 uh, Berkeley City network sites, that is. Uh, Berkeley City uh, Music is a non-profit program that provides music education to 4th through 12th graders from undeserved communities in 20 states and Puerto Rico, underserved it should be. Within a short time after her arrival, Banfield raised the academic standards for the Berkeley City Music Boston program, creating a richer experience for students through collaborations with the music education, liberal arts, Africana studies, and professional performance departments, said Berkeley College of Music President Roger H. Brown. Quote, in her new role as dean, she will broaden her oversight to give similar direction on a national level. Banfield came to Berkeley in 2006. Prior to that, she served as Director of Education for the American Compos Composers Forum and was responsible for developing national curricular products including BandQuest and the Composers Suitcase. She also served as an adjunct voice professor and music lecturer at the University of St. Thomas and taught voice at the St. Paul uh, Conservatory of Music. In other words, she's a singer. Uh, Banfield has performed as a soloist and uh, um, choreoster in such venues at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., Orchestra Hall in Minneapolis, and the Five Flags Center in Dubec. I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Music Education from Howard University the Great Howard University, a Master of Music from Indiana University, Bloomington, another major university, and a doctorate in education with concentrations in curriculum development, critical pedagogy, and educational leadership from the University of St. Thomas, Minneapolis. Currently, she serves as a board member at large for uh, Orchard Garden K-8 Boston Pilot School and on the board for the Boston Children's Chorus. With year-round instruction, expert faculty, individualized mentoring, and a comprehensive curriculum, Berkeley City Music combines the breadth of Berkeley resources, facilities, and available scholarships with an environment of attention and encouragement. Kids get the tools and support they need to flourish as students, musicians, and perhaps most importantly, to become confident and well-rounded individuals 
who are ready to shape their world. I like this very much. <laughs> what um, accolades, uh, remarkable uh, uh, descriptions exactly of what you do. So, uh, Dr. Banfield, yes. I am so curious <laughs> about what um, uh, city music is. The term is uh, poetic, um, mm. uh, so poetic that it's attractive. Yes. So I want to know, what is it exactly? Well, the term city music um, really is about urban youth and giving them the opportunity to have access to quality music education. Berkeley being a popular music education is a wonderful opportunity to create common ground reaching the urban youth so that they would be attracted to this opportunity to have these experiences to learn about themselves, to develop their voices, uh, to develop leadership skills, and of course develop their craft in music. Mm. Yes. Who originated um, the, 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 the concept? Is that uniquely a product of Berkeley, uh, or yeah. is it something that Berkeley inherited from somewhere else, it, city music? Sure. It actually is uniquely Berkeley's. Um, it was a, a, a thought child of uh, Lee Burke uh, for the namesake of the school, but it was actually established by Curtis Warner, uh, Jr., um, who is a very strong community person, and he is an, a, he's an associate vice president at the college and a music educator himself. And he was 17 years in Boston Public Schools, but really wanted to do more to help our young people to, again, learn about themselves and have access to quality education, and also to demystify what it means to consider college, you know, as a place, uh, destination for young people to be able to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it uh, exactly that you think was um, mystical until after city music was originated to demystify it? Um, well, it's like having that big uh, thing on the hill, the, the big institution, and you have all the young people and families who may be in neighborhoods and they stay in their neighborhoods. Um, perhaps they're intimidated. And so this was that opportunity to help to um, give them the chance to, to know that, no, this is a place that you can also find yourself in. See. This is a place that you can strive to be at, mm -hmm. you know, for your future, mm -hmm. to give them hope. How do you recruit these students from these huge um, masses of students out there, uh, each of which has, uh, has heard of the brand name Berkeley? As you know, Berkeley is a big name in the music industry. Yes. And uh, may think, uh, as you say, that they may not have the resources with which to qualify which means that the institution will have to develop rigorous standards such as what you've developed, which Roger Brown uh, credits you for, yes. uh, so that uh, you can um, recruit students. Uh, let's talk about the recruitment process. Lead me step by step of Absolutely. how it's done. Absolutely. Um, well, I would say that it's messy work. Um, it's grassroots work. We have multiple um, relationships with community organizations, boys and girls clubs, Zoomix, different places in different neighborhoods where we find ourselves and, and where we talk to the parents, where we talk to the children and, and those people who help to serve them and let them know what's going on. So that's one effort. Another effort is our relationship with the Boston Public Schools. We provide a lot of resources to Boston Public Schools. We're actually in 17 of the public schools where we send teachers into the schools to work with the music teachers who were there to provide them resources similar to what you might find in a more affluent school district so that the children really have access to a number of resources like private lessons, like one-on-one -on -one instruction, like curriculum materials, technology, and you know, all of those things so that they have the opportunity to flourish just like the, the other youngsters who are in other uh, cities. And so with that, we then have auditions, we have 
um, concerts. We invite them to, to come to the campus. We also send students out. We create peer mentoring opportunities for young people so that children who are just a little older than some of the youngsters who we have conversations with and the parents and families, the caregivers that we have conversations with, are able to meet them where they are and show them things. And that then begins to interest them. Of course, because it's popular music, they get to hear music that interests them right away. And then we provide opportunities for them to say, well, what music do you like? Sure. Yes, and how, would you, how do you think this music is created? What do you think it's about? Let's take the opportunity to do some deep listening to really learn what it means. And then think about the context of what the music is coming from and what the implications are for the music. And having those com conversations with them, going deeper and deeper each step, pulls the children in. And of course, their parents are coming with them. And then we provide scholarship. Berkeley is very dedicated and raises a lot of funds to be able to support the children so that we can provide uh, funds to support the professors and any other number of, uh, of administrators, which includes me, mm -hmm. uh, but also all of the resources that we provide for the children. And those who continue on, many get scholarship to come to the college itself, and then they also get scholarship to go to other colleges. Another thing that we do, too, is that we partner with the city, and we have concerts in the cities. And so it's also there that we're looking at young people and looking at instruments, having conversations. A lot of this is relationship building. Uh, I love the notion it takes a village to raise young people. And so that's really the mantra that uh, we go on. That's one that I live by because it can't be done alone. And so we have multiple con conversations and are always very much acting in an activist role um, uh, with the charge of really trying to pull as many young people in as we can. And then they also do that too. Then they go out, especially those that are in the program. They're very proud to be part of this experience. And we really do espouse to have this atmosphere where they have total confidence and freedom uh, to express themselves, to be themselves, uh, and to work hard. And so that's the kind of ethic that we, we you know, work toward. Mm -hmm. mm, uh, on my way here, without um, giving a name, uh, I told uh, someone uh, that I was going to um, uh, interview you. Oh. Uh, it was a she, and uh, he told me she's brilliant. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, and um, uh, it's very obvious uh, that you are. Now, um, what I would like to learn from you is what is it that um, you studied when you did um, a PhD in education sure. that qualified you to, to, to accept this position? Uh -huh. um, well, I studied, I got into a program that was uh, in educational leadership, which sits in the area of sociology and anthropology, uh, and also critical pedagogy, which really looks deeply at the kinds of systems and things that in short, oppress people or hold them back. And so the idea is to give people agency and look at education from a very broad perspective. And it can be any kind of tool in any kind of education. And so I found that to be the perfect place for music and a particular popular music, which is, if you look at the word popular, it's intended to be music and the voices of the people. Yes. And, uh, also looking at popular music, you're talking about American popular music and the music of the African diaspora and the result of that. And so all of those things were wonderful intersections, if you will, uh, for um, you know, developing a dissertation, doing study, deep study, and how to really communicate and how to empower and uplift people, how to be able to come into situations and understand multiple cultures and uh, multiple styles in which people communicate, have understanding, 
and then look at ways in which you come to service and serve people so that you can lift them up, they can be educated, and you can at least bring them to a certain point so that they're ready to go to the next place of education and learning. Mm. And now, when you recruit these um, students from these various neighborhoods, mm -hmm. are you guided by prisms of race, gender, sex, or do you singularly focus on merit? Uh, we're guided by all of those prisms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say that um, in my experience, uh, especially given the music, it, it would be, you can't do that. You know, it would be false to think that you could just go in and only do it based on merit. Um, if you're going to empower or help someone to build their self-esteem, um, you have to help them to see what it is that they, you know, what it is that's around them um, and also acknowledge uh, any number of things from challenges to, to positive circumstances. So, you know, if you're looking to do these things and then also help to um, impart tools so that the young people can go forward and be leaders in their, whatever their journey might be, um, you have to look at those, those uh, various facets of, of the individual, of society, in order to be successful. And so it is, it's messy work, yes. but I love it. Um, and I've been fortunate to be around numbers of people who really um, live for this, those same kinds of things um, and look to uh, work together, you know, and always looking for opportunities to empower the young people. Mm. Uh, and uh, help to lift them up and, and give them that opportunity to mm. speak. Mm. Mm -hmm. And in your case, of course, uh, you're not only an accomplished academic, uh, but also a singer. Yes. Um, in what way do you think uh, the fact that you're a singer puts you at a position much superior, someone else who could have expressed an interest uh, to come to this job, but is not musically inclined like you. What is the leverage that your musicality gives you to do this work and do it well, sure. as you obviously do? Sure. Um, I don't know if it would be superior, I would say, as much as it is, I would say, leverage. Um, I would say that it is probably, I've been very fortunate to have some extraordinary teachers, a legacy of teachers. Um, I actually studied classical music, although I listened to all music and sang all music, sang in church. Um, but when I was coming up, you had a certain kind of music yes. if you were going to study in school at the time. Uh, and so I came to, to understand and enjoy that music. Um, but as a singer, I was fortunate to be able to study with two individuals who broke a lot of the color barriers in the U.S. and also uh, in Europe. Uh, one person's name is Matawilda Dobbs. Uh, and then the other was Camilla Williams. Um, both broke a lot of color lines in their day and uh, instilled that uh, kind of, of um, energy and, uh, you know, giving all of us who studied with them the torch to really continue uh, moving forward with this idea of using the voice to touch people's hearts to be able to uh, break down barriers and bring people together. They went through so, so much. Um, I was uh, most recently close to Camilla, who passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, she was one who had to actually dress in whiteface. And people don't know that. Uh, but uh, as a singer in New York, uh, with the New York City Opera at the time, you're talking about the 1940s. Um, but that was a, an experience that she used to have, and she said she used to cry all the time. Uh, but she took those experiences and put it into her music, and then taught all of us uh, that came after her uh, to have the same kind of fortitude. And she became an extraordinary teacher, a celebrated teacher, recording artist. Uh, she sang uh, at the March on Washington. Um, and uh, also sang for uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. King's um, 
Nobel Peace Prize when he received that as well and sang before many presidents. You know, so that kind of, of um, mentor instills so much uh, that I have no choice but to uh, move forward and to continue to uh, give back in that way and to empower others. Mm -hmm. When I'm listening to you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm also reminded of um, uh, how you sound, um, you sound like you've internalized some of the messages of the pedagogy of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. Um, which I'm sure you did when you did your, your PhD work. And uh, you seem to have taken uh, techniques from that work um, mm -hmm. in your relationship with the types of geniuses that are hidden in these um, uh, neighborhoods yes. uh, from which you recruit yes. uh, potentially great musicians. Would I be correct in making this serious Absolutely. Absolutely. I think about mm. Paulo Freire. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, when I think of uh, city music too, correct me again, uh, I'm invariably led uh, to think about black youth uh, in particular. Sure. Both males and females who, yes. were it not for this inventive program that you're honing and sharpening for mm -hmm. them, would feel so intimidated uh, to think that the Berkeley musical zone is in within their reach. Mm. Uh, you are making uh, the, the, this zone available for them. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's interesting as you, as you talk about that and particularly about the black males, um, I'm almost brought to tears uh, when our black males come together because mm. our, our situation is that uh, it is so popular that we have a lot of black males uh, and we always work hard to recruit more of our females. Um, and I just, you know, when you see the stereotypes and you hear people and you see people even so much as grabbing a purse or something or being yeah. nervous when they see another young black male, I just say, how, how you have to see the males that I work with right. and how expressive they are and how confident and caring they are, uh, so confident that they show expression to each other, you know, a very fraternal, supportive atmosphere and always looking to do peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentoring and uh, helping their young sisters along and helping their teachers along. Right. It's just a, it's an extraordinary uh program and in, in, in that and in, in place and it's it's always it's such an inspiration this is what you know it gets me up moving every single day absolutely and yeah. uh, without even knowing it now I know why uh, Provost Larry Simpson uh, wanted me to interview you uh, now I know what the explanation for these startling experiences that I have in the classroom with my black male students uh, yes. coming from they are gifted. They have been dreamy yes. to, to, to come to Berkeley. Yes. Um, and they think they are blessed and lucky to be here. And of course, I'm not a musician, but the universal judgment is that those that you and others have recruited, whom we experience in our classrooms, are just terrific musicians <laughs> and terrific human beings. And uh, in that, uh, you're quite right. One begins to reshape one's imagination because when you listen to the media you are invariably led to think that these black males are incarcerated only yes uh, as if that is all that they are doing yeah. or uh, they are simply playing ball yeah. um, uh, but very rarely uh, do we hear um, since the death of Coltrane and uh, yeah. Miles um, a sustenance of a tradition of musical genius in these neighborhoods. Absolutely. Um, I may not know what I'm talking about. I'm merely hypothesizing. You're the expert. No, no you're Correct right me so there. So that I can think correctly. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. My, my belief, just as my teacher's belief, is that her belief was that if you can speak, you can sing. You can make the connections. Music is a part of humanity. It's a human... Um, uh, communication, it's, it's 
part of, of who we are. Some, some cultures, some African cultures, don't even have a word for it. It's just a, it's something that's lived, that's, yeah. that's just part of, of how we communicate, how we express, how we, how we hold our culture and our history, how we heal people, you know. Um, and so I look at every child as, as they all have an opportunity for genius. Absolutely. And again, um, to your credit, I'm, I'm so excited that we have gotten to know you, and I hope that you're going to become a regular con uh, contributor to Art Van Asen, because yeah. you're doing some foundational work. To your credit also, I recently began taking great pride in the classrooms. Yes. When I hear um, our black students, our black male students, uh, also speaking about these great female musicians, not only yes. vocalists this time, they play the trumpet, yes. the clarinet, the saxophone, yes. the drums, yes. and many other instruments, and they play them well, and these black males and others know about them. Yes. And when you see them uh, running, uh, running around uh, Berkeley, when I meet them when they're going to class or coming out of class, you sense that they are happy to be at Berkeley, realizing dreams. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We have numbers of females, and the more that, that are, are uh, put in the professional lights, when you see, for example, Esperanza Spaulding, who was actually a work study in the program Amazing. when she was a student at Berkeley, uh, the number of young women that have come behind her that play bass and play it very, very well. You know, looking for those opportunities. Others uh, playing saxophone, as you said, drums. We have some extraordinary drum drum players uh, in in women, and all of the guys t just really respect them. Very you know, and lift so. them up uh, yes. and challenge them. They challenge each other. Exactly. You know, it's a it's really really beautiful. Yes, it, it, it's not what the, you pick from the news media. The news media presents the black male as aggressive. Exactly. Um, hypersexual. Yes, um, exactly. Lazy. Yes. Uh, disrespectful of women. Mm -hmm. These are not the black males that I'm encountering no. in my classrooms, as a matter of fact. No. These are empirical observations. Mm -hmm. And my observation is that it must have something to do with the rigor of the recruitment process. Yes. Uh, the, the students that I'm blessed to, 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 to be in the, a teacher of are just exceptional human beings, yes. both as musicians and as students. They respect me. Yes. Um, they do their work occasionally, of course, as a function of youth. They may not do their work here, they work there. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a universal problem. Right. Other than that, when you, when you look at them, it's totally unlike the images mm -hmm. that the news media is spreading about. Them. Exactly. So uh, I can't help but uh, thank you for, for, for what you're doing. And now, uh, I don't know how to ask this. Uh, mm -hmm. I will have to be very precise so that I can get a precise answer from you. Uh, the academic lingua for, for what I would like to talk about is uh, intersectionality. Mm. Um, to be honest with you, I don't even know what that means. Um, as an analytic philosopher, I'm accustomed to break things down. Mm. I can understand relationships between something like race, gender, mm. sex, income, and wealth. And um, I don't need the term intersectionality uh, to, to to talk about them in relationship <laughs> with one another, but uh, academics uh, like new languages. Yes. So um, they talk about um, intersectionality. Um, could we talk a little bit about that? Or sure. What we is can it talk exactly? About it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, w I look at it as, as uh, the, uh, I guess, the common space between two spheres uh, and what may uh, come of that uh, kind of, I guess if we were talking about chemistry or physics or something, you know, it's, it's, there's this energy that comes about uh, between the two uh, entities that this, this kind of thing emerges and, and what happens, what are the implications, what is, um, what is the outcome of, of, of that, you know, the intersectionality. Okay. Yes. Now, uh, let me share with you um, an observation. Uh, an informal observation sure. uh, with sociological implications, I think. Okay. Let me first describe what I'm observing. For the past two years or so, in almost all my classes, uh, my female students are bitterly complaining um, that they are not being treated.
Peter Wan mm. uh, at Berkeley. Mm. Um, they report uh, that some of them are ridiculed and laughed mm. uh, by uh, male musicians mm -hmm. if uh, they are caught describing themselves um, as uh, musicians who could play several instruments. Mm -hmm. uh, the males have a tendency to think that they can only play the voice, mm. in short, that they are only vocalists. Mm -hmm. And to make uh, matters worse, some of them also s s say that some of their professors uh, do not take them uh, very seriously mm. um, as musicians. Um, uh, that they are not given opportunities that are um, given to males, for example. Um, when they are invited to play in bands, they mm. tell me, um, those who invite them prefer them to be background music, mm. um, as opposed to being um, visible mm -hmm. uh, in the front, mm -hmm. because their voices, mm -hmm. uh, some mm -hmm. of these band leaders uh, mm -hmm. say, are not sufficiently strong uh, to carry the tone of the band. Mm. Uh, they prefer males to do the leading mm. and uh, for females uh, to just be in the background. And mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, Dr. Banfield, because I'm not a musician, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just a curious philosopher, mm -hmm. I can only listen. So what sure. I'm summarizing for you is uh, a product of a listening. Um, perhaps you can help me uh, to, to, to sort of articulate what this um, and, uh, some of my female students may be talking about. Sure. First of all, it's a problem. <laughs> that, that should not be happening. And um, when I peel away, or when I think in terms of peeling away all of the different layers and isms and all of those things, and we first look at uh, just the individuals, I have to think, well, there's intimidation first. Uh, that happens. Um, surely a lot of the women that are at the collegiate level, at the college level, are there for a reason. Uh, and they have to work even harder oftentimes than their male counterparts in order to be able to prove that, especially if they are uh, very strong instrumentalists. Uh, also, the profession continues to do that as well. And a lot of times it comes from, it's from uh, intimidation. Um, from from a lot of male intimidation, um, and I would say that at the college, it's a regular conversation by uh, leadership and by all of us who uh, are in administrative uh, positions and trying to make some differences. There's several women's councils uh, where we have uh, conversations about this and look at ways and trying to break those things down. Look at ways of, of creating allies among the males who are, uh, don't feel this way to help to educate the others, which includes the faculty, uh, so that there's this kind of effect of a culture because sometimes these kinds of negative things uh, can fester almost like a cancer and uh, really can rip through uh, um, communities and different relationships that would otherwise be positive. So it is a, a large concerted effort. Um, one of the things that's very glowing is this beautiful picture of a woman who is on the side of the building. Um, that's the theater, the one. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, the uh, performance center. That's right. And she's playing the bass. Yes, I love that. Yeah, yes, which completely that breaks stereotype. Yes, I love you know? that image. Yeah, yes. and she's On beautiful. On Boylston Street, right? Exactly, yeah. uh -huh. and she's beautiful. She's yes. not uh, sexualized. Yes. She looks like a professional, and she just looks like a beautiful, she looks like a beautiful woman who knows what she's doing. Exactly. You know, so it takes those kinds of things uh, to be able to continue to tear down the stereotypes like we have to in so many areas uh, to be able to um, to combat that kind of thinking, you know, because the very person that uh, does those things, uh, the young woman will end up getting that job opportunity and they'll be standing by the wayside, you know, so, uh, but it is a, an ongoing effort that we always have to address. Uh, and that we always um, come around and do our best to mentor 
uh, both our young men and our young, of course, the young women, but the young men as well. Incredible. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Banfield, then I should um, credit myself, I think, for opening uh, the doors of Afghan Afghanistan for the past five years mm -hmm. uh, to musicians, the preponderant number of which were yeah. women. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we are here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, my best guests have always been young women. I give them the forum. It's a combination of 30 minutes of interviews, like what um, I'm doing with you, uh -huh. and then 30 minutes of performance. And I have hardly invited uh, vocalists exclusively. They are drummers. Mm. They play the trumpet. They play the saxophone. They play the guitar. Uh, they are brilliant. They speak well. They think well. And because I'm not capable of thinking otherwise uh, as a human being. Maybe a function of the fact that I'm a fool. Um, uh, uh -huh. I, I, I do not look at the human beings by quartering them into their gender, yes. their sex and race. Uh, I'm just interested uh, in human beings yes. who, who, who engage me. And I tell my students I'm hoping that I will contribute to the flourishing of this culture at Berkeley yeah. as a philosopher. I have an obligation. Maybe because I have two daughters whom I think the world of sure. who are much smarter than I. And I couldn't possibly imagine having conversations with them they are not, that are not guided by intelligence. Mm -hmm. it's not, I'm not even capable. Sure. They, 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 they are smarter than me. Yes. They, they, they are more sensitive than me, so forth and so on. So when my students tell me this, Dr. Bank, I get shocked. Sure, sure. I really get shocked. And some of them uh, say these things in tears. Yeah. Uh, they tell That's me about terrible. males have told them yeah. that their hands, their fingers, are so weak mm -hmm. that they cannot even hold the guitar. That's and awful. then one bright female student told me, perhaps it did not uh, occur to my teacher, uh, that the guitars are too big. Mm. And, and, and in that perhaps the guitars would have to be reframed to accommodate the mm. uh, physiological uh, condition uh, of a woman as a human being. That's terrible. So these are some of the classroom issues, Dr. Banfield. Sure. And, uh, um, I get very hurt by them because yeah. I see my students hurting. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's awful. And that's just awful. I hope that uh, people in positions of power such as you take these complaints seriously and act oh, on absolutely. them. And I'm comforted by the fact that you are aware of them. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We take every, uh, every situation very seriously. And yes. certainly these kinds of things that tear people down. My God, yeah. it's very similar to the way blacks uh, have been treated in the South. Exactly. Uh, from uh, the South uh, that gave us some of the greatest writers in the world. Yes. Uh, who were told that they cannot write, they, they, they cannot speak, they cannot think. Exactly. Uh, their place is not the book. And uh, this reminds me yes. of that kind of struggle. Yes, absolutely. Mm. So absolutely. anyway, um, I'm comforted uh, that you are aware of them. Yes. And now, um, uh, you did um, mention to me that you brought a video. That yeah, you like I just brought a few videos. Yes. yes. Uh, um, perhaps we can spend the rest of the time on those. Okay. Take your time and uh, okay. introduce us to the uh, map of city music. Sure, absolutely. Right. Um, well, some of the videos that, that I've brought um, are, well, I can talk about the structure, actually, because okay. we start very early. We start with uh, children that are age nine. Uh, we have the original, what we call the original bro program, which is City Music Boston, and that's located at the college. And we start at grade four, which is nine-year-old students, young people. Uh, but we also have some that are a little bit younger, and we do... Uh, all kinds of mentoring and working with them, but we get them playing right away. So yeah. they're interested in playing. We make sure that they are able to do that and they have the opportunity to be in several ensembles. We have a partnership with the Boston Arts Academy. So the youngest of the program actually go there on Saturdays and they get their instruction there, but they are taught by um, various Berkeley alum as well as Berkeley faculty. So they have no idea the yeah. level of uh, education that they're getting and it's at no cost to, to their families. 
Um, we raise the funds and they uh, get scholarship for that. So, yeah. um, uh, perhaps uh, we can begin showing the, the videos uh, if they're yeah. available so that Dr. Banfield could look at the videos and describe them for the audience. Sure. Roll them, please. It, it, that's titled uh, Pre-University Learning System Experience, <laughs> Pulse. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, it has several units and it uh, is all based in popular music and young people get to learn about the basic elements of music, the form, the rhythm, uh, how to improvise, there's examples of music. We also have a lot of popular music. There's some games, uh, but there's also some, some film footage, but it gives the young people a chance to explore, uh, and it's led by uh, instructors, so it's not necessarily independent of uh, something for the students to do. There are some things for them to do, but it's primarily intended for the teachers to help to create an atmosphere that's conducive for their learning. Uh, in popular music. And so this is just a, an example of some mentoring that's happening uh, with some of the students. Uh, and it's a very, uh, of course, broadly diverse uh, group. And uh, uh, some of the other videos that we have um, are of the uh, high school's uh, ensembles. And they sound very professional. I think that uh, people would be surprised the level of um, performance and professionalism and musicianship that the young people have even at the high school level. Mm. And then I also have uh, a very self-explanatory uh, video because we do a lot of professional development with all of the communities that mm -hmm. we work with. Mm -hmm. um, we actually now, since that uh, that you were so kind to read yeah. uh, was written, uh, we actually now have 47 communities that we work with to include two communities in Canada and Vancouver and also in Toronto. And we partner with uh, communities and organizations that have similar values that they're looking to target to help their young people who are most disenfranchised. And together we um, try to, we work on uh, professional development, work on capacity building, building partnerships, helping them to build partnerships in their own communities, and then Berkeley also provides scholarships for their young people to be able to come to the campus during the summer to get a professional experience and a time away from home and to focus and improve their music skills and also to meet young people from all over the world. Uh, and they're always so it's such an environment that is is uh, so inspiring and so rewarding. They oftentimes don't want to leave. Yeah, yeah I can <laughs> um, imagine. But one of the conversations that we had with one of our young people, our youngsters, who is actually from New Orleans, and he works with an extraordinary teacher by the name of Donald Harrison. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a saxophone player, and uh, he has... Uh, is a Berkeley alum, but also has been playing for many, many years. But he's very sensitive to um, the kinds of work that it requires, uh, really in the traditional sense of being a griot and doing uh, work in that capacity. So now this is our, our um, conference that we had. So this just kind of talks about the professional development that we did. Wow. And last, this was last year. And so it was a partnership that we did with an agency called A Place Called Home, mm -hmm. and they're a wraparound agency. So the City Music Network is a so that's, uh, of Curtis. 48 like-minded, community-based organizations that believe in reaching urban youngsters and uh, giving them access to rigorous education, building social strengths, uh, helping them emotionally, academically, and really putting them on par with their more advantaged peers. Working with communities, particularly Berkeley student music communities, you're talking about people who align themselves with 
the idea of wanting to empower their young people. The Berkeley City Music Network program is a great resource for inner city kids, I feel like, because every child or every kid that is musically inclined or has a dream to be in the field of music does not go to a school for performing arts or is maybe not going to um, have the right resources around them to inspire them to go to a Berkeley College of Music. But a program like this, it provides the inspiration, it provides the networking, it provides the resources for these kids to have an actual shot of eventually going on to go to a school like Berkeley and get, get that kind of training. My personal experience in my life has been empowered by music. Berkeley's about taking the opportunity of musical access and career access and bringing that to literally tens if not hundreds of thousands of students so from the minute I started in my life path um, I've been in this space and to be here and be able to serve students every day is a pretty amazing opportunity. Music is kind of like helps to run the world it touches us to, in, to our innermost parts our spirits and that's how influential music is and I think it will never die but we want to protect it. We want to do all the things that we can do to make it as wonderful as it can possibly be. And everybody has a different gift. Even in the music industry, you may play, you may sing, you know, those kinds of things. And you need to be prepared to do it to the best of your ability. So somebody's got to teach you that. <laughs>
primarily a need-based uh, scholarship. Uh, and then, of course, we look at uh, the merit of their academics and also uh, their performance. And so these are some of the best and brightest among uh, those that uh, uh, are able to be here and uh, very talented. And it's a fantastic show. And so I'd like to invite everybody to come. It's on uh, Tuesday. I believe it's August 11th. I don't want yeah. to make that mistake. At 7:30 at the Berkeley Performance Center, uh, and the proceeds, of course, go to to continued scholarship funds. It's always difficult because we want yes. to be able to give so much more scholarship, and there's only so many funds that are are raised. Uh, but this year we'll be uh, acknowledging um, at least 13 students right now uh, who will receive who have received full tuition college scholarships to be able to go to school. And as we know, it's so expensive today to be able to afford to go to school. And so we're always talking with the families, helping to um, provide the resources, educate them, uh, put them with other groups so that they can be prepared as much as possible because everybody wants to be able to do something for their young people. Uh, and so we figure out creative ways uh, even if it's not Berkeley, we uh, don't necessarily say, well, this is yeah. the place for you. We yes. say, you must go where you fit, where yeah. you feel that it's best for you at this point in your life, and to know that music is a lifetime pursuit that is something that will always be with you. Wonderful. We have about um, uh, two minutes left, um, okay. I'm being told. Um, uh, we have hardly begun the interview, but uh, since um, I have cordially invited you to consider coming, coming back again and again, uh, like um, uh, your husband, uh, Bill Banfield, uh, yeah. whom uh, I think um, highly of. And um, it, it, Berkeley is quite lucky to have two talented individuals uh, like you and Berkeley uh, housed in the same college yeah. with uh, Bill doing some incredible work in Africana studies, yes. uh, liberal arts, yeah. uh, and you, a combination of liberal arts and the music, exactly like yes. Bill, he's yeah. also a performer. and. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a professor of music. So um, uh, Berkeley is uh, quite lucky uh, to have you and I'm very, very lucky to have become introduced to you thanks to uh, Larry Simpson um, who insisted that I uh, invite you. Oh, I'm glad I well, did. I appreciate and, uh, I'll have to tell Larry thank you of so course. much. This has uh, been we'll, such a privilege. Thank you. We're going to uh, continue partnering together. And yes. um, when you come back, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions of how we could internationalize this so that it could also focus on the neighborhoods of the continent of Africa. Yes. Where there are great hidden talents. Absolutely. Waiting to be discovered. I'm sure this has crossed your mind. Because Roger Brown is interested in African matters. Yes. Since he has spent some time there. Yes. But we'll leave that for a, a future program. I think we have about uh, one minute left, and um, I would like you to use it um, in any way you want, but it appears that uh, uh, we are done, and uh, I can only say this, that Afghan Ascent is deeply grateful uh, to have invited you and uh, to have learned from you, and I hope that you're sufficiently enticed uh, to consider coming every year and um, give us um, a report on how uh, city music is doing. This has been your host, Kyodros Kiros, for Afghan Ascent. Then you put your charm around me I can't resist this sweet surrender All my nights are warm and tender